Right, thanks for joining me once again, where today I'm looking at a piece of epidemiology which I found wildly amusing and also very, very interesting. It's not a new piece of epidemiology. This one was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in 2009. Um, it's not one I've read before. It was brought to my attention this morning when I read a very amusing tweet by Dr. Paul Mason about this study, uh, which I found to be heartening and um, and all manner of, uh, of amusement did abound. Um, now, I to qualify what I'm about to say, I know full well that Paul Mason is more than competent to make statistical analyses, to look at this data for himself. And I'm suspecting that he chose not to on purpose for comedy reasons, as I may well have been tempted to do myself. Because if we wanted to behave like those uh, individuals who run around online making videos where they attempt to demonize the consumption of meat and animal products and promote the consumption of a diet consisting entirely of plants, for example, then what we would do is we would take the relative outcome statistics reported by such epidemiological studies and we would state those and leave it at that. And, so, and, and just by omission of a clear statement to the, to the contrary, we would just show how vastly important and terrifying these results are and leave people to then go and be influenced by that alone. Now I say that because this is a study which had some interesting findings with regard to the incidence rates of cancer in a European population of 63,550 men and women that were prospectively followed for a number of years in a study called the EPIC Oxford study, um, which is another study that uh, said um, antagonists of ours do like to cite quite a bit. Anyway, this one was, was interesting. So let's have a look at the, at the results table, shall we? So here is table three, the results table. And the result of interest that jumps out at, uh, at the reader certainly jumped out at Paul Mason. And I, as I say, I do understand why he did what he did. And I fully support it as a good, uh, a good uh, devil's advocacy, a good bit of humor. But here's what it says. It says that in the non-vegetarian sub-cohort, the... That is taken as the control situation in this particular comparison I'm about to give you. So therefore it has a, an incidence risk attendant to it of 1.00. It has the same incidence risk as itself. Okay, fine. Um, so the non-vegetarians have a 1.00 risk of developing colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer. Okay, let's, let's see what the incidence risk was in the vegetarians as compared to the non-vegetarians. Whoops, goodness me. The risk of colorectal cancer in vegetarians was 1.49 or that is a 49% increase in risk of colorectal cancer if you are a vegetarian as compared to if you are non-vegetarian. So, obviously, that's a huge change in risk. Obviously important. You should all be terrified if you're vegetarian and stop it immediately. There you go. End of video. At least, it would be if I behaved like those charlatans, like those pseudoscientific crackpots tend to do. I don't know. So what I'm actually going to do for you, as a public service, is I'm going to help you to learn how to analyze these things for yourself and challenge these things for yourself so that when people splash these kind of data in front of you, you can go, hang on a minute, hang on just a minute. So here is the bit that comes after the Vox Pop shock headline, 49% increase in risk of colorectal cancer if you're a vegetarian. Well, what we need to do 
is we need to convert that into an absolute incidence differential because the relative differential has no meaning whatsoever. It has no frame of reference. Example, if I had a million vegetarians and a million non-vegetarians and I followed them for a year, I would have a million person years of follow-up in vegetarians and a million person years of follow-up in non-vegetarians, wouldn't I? Good. At least that's how it went when I went to school. Good. Okay. Let's say the incidence of colorectal cancer in the vegetarians was one person in that million person years of follow-up. One in a million got cancer. Okay. And in the vegetarians, two of them got cancer, colorectal cancer. So what I can now report is a 100% increase in risk or a risk ratio of 200%. Except that's not really what I saw, was it? What I really saw in that hypothetical uh, situation is an absolute incidence differential of one in a million. See how that's very, very different to describing that like a 100%, it is, absolutely, it's a 100% change in relative risk. However, if I had a million person years of follow-up in vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and the difference was 100,000 diagnoses in the non-vegetarians and 200,000 in the vegetarians, that's still the exact same 100% increase in risk, isn't it? However, that is a much more meaningful, much more powerful result, because now, instead of a difference of one in a million, we have a, dif a, a difference of 100,000 times that. They're completely different results, aren't they? with completely different meanings, completely different utilities to the general public at large, and indeed to any given individual who wants to look at this data and say, what does that mean for me, if anything? Okay, so let's do a conversion. Here we go. What we need to do is go to the table, which is table two in this paper, which describes how many of these people were in each of the populations. So. If we do that, here it is here, what we find is that the population is broken up thusly. We had 7,973 men and 27,652 women who were not vegetarian. That's a total of 35,625 persons. Okay. In the vegetarians, we had 4,257 men and 12,824 women, or 17,081 persons. Okay, how long were they followed for in the study? We have to go to the top of the, the paper to have a look at that. And when we do that, what we find is that these people were recruited between 1993 and 1999. So let's say, for an estimate, on average, they were recruited in 1996. Because they, they could have been three years earlier or they could have been up to three years later. So let's take the, let's take the, the median value, 1996. Okay, this study ceased the follow-up in 2005, giving us nine years of follow-up for each one of those individuals. So, if we grab a trusty calculator and do some calculations, what we find is we have 
320,625 person years of follow-up in our non-vegetarian population. In our vegetarian population, we have 153,729 person years of follow-up. So, the next question is, how many cases of cancer did we get in each of those situations? Let's have a look. Okay, so here it is here. We have the first column here, colorectal cancer. And if we look at the vegetarian status uh, differential situation, which is the second from the bottom down here, we'll see that non-vegetarians for colorectal cancer are our control group. So they have a risk ratio of 1.0 and our non-vegetarians have a risk ratio of 1.49 or a 49% increase in risk of colorectal cancer. Mm, okay, except let's have a look at the numbers, shall we? On the left, which we'll call the control group, the control group is called referred to generally as on the left. Don't ask me why. Let's grab a calculator. Okie dokie. We had 166 diagnoses of colorectal cancer over nine years in that group of 320,625 individual person years. So the rate of cancer diagnosis per person per year on the left in our control situation, our non-vegetarians was, are you ready? 0 0.0005. Or let's say it's causal and it's a risk ratio genuinely, which it isn't because it's an associative study, but just for fun, let's say it is. We have five chances in 10,000 of being diagnosed with colorectal cancer if you're a non-vegetarian. That's the baseline incidence. Let's have a look at the experimental incidence, the vegetarian population, shall we? Okay. What we had was 62 diagnoses of colorectal cancer. Out of a number of person years of follow-up, which numbered 153,729 individual person years of follow-up, which gave us an absolute incidence of diagnosis of colorectal cancer in the vegetarians of, are you ready? 0. 0.0. .0 zero, zero, four. Okay, couple of points here. Number one, zero point zero 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 four is lower than zero point zero 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 five, isn't it? Yes, so actually, these researchers did not observe an increased incidence of colorectal cancer in the vegetarians at all. If anything, they observed a lower incidence of colorectal cancer in the vegetarians as compared with the non-vegetarians. That said, the difference was one chance of diagnosis per person per 10,000 years of follow-up, or one chance in 10,000 per person per year. So the difference was, in fact, really nothing. But if anything, it was lower, and certainly not 49% higher. What skullduggery has gone on here, boys and girls? Well, I'll tell you what, they have adjusted the risk ratio, which is another word for fabricating it. 
because a risk ratio should be based on the incidences observed, not by adding in still more correlations, which each have an error and are not causal artifacts. I've covered this in depth in a previous video talking about why we should absolutely never, ever adjust an outcome statistic. It is fabrication. It is academic misconduct. It allows people to say things that are not so, like if you're a vegetarian, your risk of colorectal cancer is 49% higher than if you're not a vegetarian, because this data doesn't bear that out, does it? What have they done? They've adjusted for, note four, they've adjusted for smoking. Oops, for smoking. There it is. That's what they've done. They've observed a lower incidence in the population of vegetarians. However, for some reason, the number of vegetarians who are smokers was higher, or the amount of smoking being undertaken by those vegetarians was higher than their non-vegetarian counterparts in, in this particular cohort, and they believe that has skewed their result, and so they've adjusted it. Completely unacceptable behavior. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, there you go. Debunked. Your risk of colorectal cancer, number one, absolutely cannot be informed by looking at an epidemiological study because these studies do not inform on risk. They purport to inform on incidents, but they don't even do that, do they, Klaus? Because as we see yet again here today, this is another example of a group of researchers led by Timothy J. Key and co-workers, there they are, who have fabricated an outcome data. They have made up a statistic, risk. How many people have ever died of risk? None. How many people have ever died of colorectal cancer? Quite a few. How many are actually diagnosed with, with colorectal cancer? Quite a few, but slightly fewer actually in the vegetarian population than the non-vegetarian population. Not 49% more risk. No. Okay, there you go. Hope this was useful. I hope that you learned something from this. I hope that in future when people from either camp come to you and say, oh look, risk this, risk that, 49%, 100%, 2 billion percent, whatever, that you will go and get the paper and you will do the calculations that I've just done. You will change the relative risk into an absolute outcome differential, unadjusted, and you will look at it and see whether it has any meaning for any given person over a 100 year lifespan. And in this case, you'll find the answer is absolutely not. There is nothing to see here. Nothing at all. No. Okay, there you go. That's my take on this cancer incidence study done by Timothy J. Key and others regarding the epic Oxford uh, population of people followed prospectively for their incidence of cancers variously. Okay, enjoy. See you next time when we'll learn to do some other calculations, I'm sure. Enjoy.